What's going on, folks? Welcome to Kick Weekly with Tim Wheaton. This is the Kickboxing Podcast, and this week we are going to be covering Glory 89, which is on Saturday night, and One Fight Night 15, which is going to be on Friday night. Tons of kickboxing action is coming up this weekend, so I appreciate you tuning in. I'm going to try to cover off and preview as much of these cards as possible. Uh, we have a major weekend with people like Jonathan DeBella fighting, Tawin Shai is fighting in kickboxing, and of course, Badr Hari is going to be fighting this weekend. Uh, Glory 89 is looking to be quite a good event for for their debut in Bulgaria. Very much excited for it. Very much looking looking forward to it. Um, And we'll also be covering some RWS action as well. Uh, So let's jump into it. So, you know, everyone probably wants to talk about Badr Hari versus Uku Yuriendal. Uh, This is going to be a heavyweight matchup where the winner will be qualified for the big glory Grand Prix at the end of this year. Let's start with Uku Yuriendal. He is a heavyweight Estonian slugger. Uh, He's coming off a knockout win against Martin Terpstra, who is the multi-time and fusion heavyweight champion. Uh, Uku Yuriendal, uh, later that same night, he fought Bahram Rajabzeda to a uh, decision loss. Uh, He packs tons of power in his hands, has questionable cardio because, you know, he's a heavyweight. That's fine. That's fair. Uh, He's got bowling balls for hands, as Michael Chavello would say. Uh, And he's going to be fighting the kickboxing legend Badr Hari. Uh, let's talk about Badr Hari a little bit, uh, as we've talked about him tons on the show already, because he's had news and canceled fights and stuff like that. He is uh, uh, certainly kickboxing royalty, and where he lands in the all-time great list is entirely up to you. Uh, whether he makes the top 10 or not, that's completely up to your biases and preferences and stuff like that. Back in 2008, he was an absolute whirlwind of a fighter. He was a a sniper, an assassin. He fought with fury. He fought with speed. He fought with power. He was amazing to watch. And he became a star because of it. And he built the nation, the kickboxing nation of Morocco into what it is today. Half of these fighters on the card are from Morocco due to the influence of Badr Hari. His influence cannot be understated. And then with his personal life and controversy, it's a study on do you separate the art from the artist? How much do you take someone's controversies and and life outside of the ring to their legacy within the ring. That's entirely up to you. There's no wrong answers here, and that is up to you. Some people would say that dismisses him entirely from steroids and other things that were going on. Fine, that's okay. And other people say, no, none of that stuff matters. It's just what actually happens in the ring. Okay, no problem. That's fine too. Both are correct arguments. It's just on what you personally prefer. And I'm not going to try to sway you one way or another. Um, But let's look at this fight this weekend where he's fighting Uku Yuriendal. Uku Yuriendal is a guy who has wins in 2023, so he is a relevant top 10 fighter. And if you are a Badr Hari fan, I have to be entirely honest with you, don't tune in. I, and I know that's harsh to hear, but be honest with yourself for a second here. This Badr Hari, is, we are, we are to the point in his legacy where fans are just looking for one more win. I think a lot of people in their head are envisioning the person who was fighting in 2008. And if he just fixes a couple of things, he'll be back to that prime. I hope no one listening is that delusional. That person who fought in 2008 is long gone. Even by the time he was fighting Rico in 2016 and 2019, that person from 2008 was long gone by then. And a lot of people may be thinking about that person who fought in 2019 and 2016 and saying, you know, that guy's still there. That guy's still there. I have to be honest with you. The guy from 2008 is certainly gone. The guy from 2019, I think, is gone as well. So even when he was out of his prime and having close fights against Rico Verhoeven, I think that ship has already sailed. It's been four years since his fights against Rico Verhoeven. Look, go back and watch his fights against Arcadius Verdrosek. Go back and watch his fight against a retired, old Alistair Overeem. It's very hard to talk about Badr Hari in any meaningful sense because... His fans are are a very sensitive bunch. Um, And and I don't want to step on anyone's toes. I don't want to be overly cruel or sensitive, but look at this career objectively and where he is today. What I will say is this fight this weekend, when we look at a win or a loss this weekend for Badr Hari, a loss is such a bigger risk. Because the shame of losing is so much worse than the glory of winning in this case, right? If you beat a guy, it's almost a lose-lose situation in this case. Like, if you beat a guy, yeah, you beat Uku Yuriendal. He's been in the top 10 for a month now. This is the highest point of Uku Yuriendal's career, and he's barely in the top 10. And if you lose to him, you lose to a guy who's never been ranked in the top 10 for his entire career. 
and maybe he's a developing fighter and stuff like that, but essentially you lost to a, a, a builder fighter. You, you lose to a jobber. So the risk associated with this fight this weekend is immense for Bader. But, but even against James McSweeney, it was a, and Alistair Overeem, like these people were at the same points in their career and that they're very much past their prime. They're not, you know, they're just fighting for legacy. They're just taking uh, uh, fun fights in an old man division. Um, and, and they were kind of at the same points in all of their careers, respectively. Uku Yuriendal is fighting for glory. He has a lot to fight for. He's a hungry guy who's going to be looking to make his name from knocking out Bader Hari. For Bader Hari, He's just looking for one more win. I don't like, and, and if he wins, he qualifies for the heavyweight Grand Prix. We'll see, you know, <laughs> okay. Uh, I wish him all the best and I wish his fans all the best, but I, I think it's, it's time. Like that 2019 guy is gone. I'm really sorry to tell you this. You have to look at how the quality of his skills in this last fight in 2022 or his other fight in 2022. And tell me, honestly, you can tell me, as you can, if you're a Bader Hari fan, tell me honestly, what does this Uku Yuriendal fight mean to you with a win? One more win. Tell me everything. So unfortunately, like this is the fight that people are going to be clicking in for, um, and it's the least relevant fight on the card. Um, so let's take a look at the other fights that are going on on this Glory 89 card, because there's some really great fights and I'm really looking forward to it. So you also have Petch, who will be looking to defend his featherweight crown against David Mejia. David is a new signing for Glory and a great addition to the competitive featherweight weight division. This man has tons of high-level experience, including matches against people like, he's already fought Tawanshai and Masaki Nori and Hasan Toy. He didn't win any. But, well, you know, he's, he's been in there with, with some of the best in the world. Um, he's an aggressive, orthodox striker. He prioritizes offense over defense. He's willing to take some punches and take some kicks to land some of his own. In fact, that's his favorite thing to do. And once he actually gets in there, he is a combination striker. He is a really exciting and fun fighter to watch. Um, and I'm hoping that we get a really fun fight uh, between him and Patch. Uh, Pechpan Morong is the long reigning featherweight king, the glory and rise 145 pound world champion looking to add the seventh defense to his name. Uh, he is an outside distance fighter, mainly a kicker. He's got a mean body kick uh, at close range. He likes to tie up with people uh, and clinch with them, really just frustrate them. So at, at range, you're just getting the, you know, your body kicked and everything like that. And then you try to close the distance on this guy and he clinches with you. He might throw you over, something like that. Um, he can be very frustrating to fight. I think people just can't figure out where to fight him, what range to fight him in, what am I supposed to do with him? Because people look so frustrated fighting him. And a lot of people get frustrated watching him as well because he's one of the highest skilled fighters. He's one of the highest skilled fighters and he's so good. It's like you almost should be knocking out your opponents, but he's fine just cruising to a pretty good decision, uh, but no one can push him. No one, people can barely push his skills. The last really close fight he had in his own weight class was against Ahmed Sheikh Musa, and it was very exciting. It was very fun. Uh, and he was doing a couple things in that fight that exposed, if you were to exploit a couple things against Petch, these would be the area. So uh, the biggest one, and, and Tajani Pezzotti also did this, but if you are going to try to beat Petch, you have to outwork him in the clinch. Because it's kickboxing, when people tie up, they often will stop trying. Because now I'm going to wait for the ref. We're not supposed to clinch. I'll just wait for the ref to break us up. But Ahmed Sheikh Musa and Tejani Bestati both worked against him in the clinch. So they tried to get overhooks and then land punches and uppercuts while in the clinch. And both of them had success there. So if you're trying to beat Petch anywhere, it's probably in the very closest range in the clinch. Because most of the time we're not going to, fighters are not going to be able to beat him from uh, from distance, from kicks and stuff like that. Uh, no, I say all that, and, and he's a, a tremendous generationally important talent. Petch is an amazing fighter to watch. He's an incredible fighter to tune in, tune in for. Uh, so that will be Petch versus David Meja. Also on the card, it's Stoyan Koplavinsky looking to avenge a loss against Soren Kaliniak. Stoyan Koplavinsky, uh, he's a Bulgarian fighter, so the card is kind of built around him a little bit. Uh, Soren Kaliniak, of course, is from Romania. Stoyan Korblevinsky is a very entertaining fighter. He's an action-packed fighter who can only lose in close split decisions. At any given moment, he might be the best fighter in the world by one point, but so most of the time he loses just by one point in a split decision. This list includes people like Tejani Bestati, Kaito Ono, uh, Soren Kaliniak, and Josh Johnsey. These are people that he dropped close split decisions to. Uh, he's just got a style that makes close split decisions almost win or lose. Um, 
He's a great pressure fighter. He loves punching combinations. He's got very good ring control and ring cutting abilities. Romania's Soren Kaliniak is a, also a pressure fighter who prioritizes heavy overhand punches, uh, loves a good combination. He never lets you sit on your strikes, and I think that's the really key to his success, that if you are planting your feet and you're ready to land a combination, he's always pushing against you so that you can never really set your feet and really throw in combination. He can be very frustrating to fight against. A lot of people can't find the range. A lot of people can't find the rhythm, uh, but I'm, I'm expecting with Stoyan and Soren, this will probably be fight of the year kind of contender. I'm expecting this to be top five. Um, now, with a win, Soren Kaliniak is just coming off a loss in his last fight, so if he beats Stoyan Koplovinsky, I'm not entirely sure what they'll do. It is very, it is a, 155 pounds is building in glory kickboxing. If Stoyan wins, I do expect him to uh, fight Tejani Bestadi for the lightweight title in glory. Um, it's just a matter of what's going on with Tejani Bestadi. He's defended his title a bunch of times. He's beaten contenders from other organizations. He's beaten almost everybody in that division. There's almost no one left for Tijani Bestadi at this point. Even a, a fight against Stoyan Korpulevinsky, like he's probably thinking, I already beat him once. What's the point of this? Tijani has been showing on his Instagram. He's doing a lot of boxing training. So how seriously he wants to step away from kickboxing and then enter professional boxing, I don't know if he is really prioritizing this or he's using it as a negotiation tactic to try to get more money out of Glory and saying like, look, I, I'm training boxing over here. I'll just switch to boxing. Um, in the past, Glory doesn't fold to those kinds of pressures, right? Like they, like uh, Alex Pereira's last fight, they were they were saying like, oh, he's already, he's already went to the UFC, he's switching to MMA. Cedric Dumbe, same thing. Oh, you want to go to MMA? Go ahead. We're not paying you more. Tajani is a little bit different than Alex Pereira and Cedric Dumbe because he really does sell tickets. Uh, Moroccan fans really do turn up for this man. He brings a great cheering section. Um, even at the last collision show, or sorry, the collision show two shows ago with Alistair Overeem and Badr Hari, Tajani Bestadi really made that event feel like it was all about him. He stole the audience in that one, and that was great to see. Um, so he's been really building a fan base who pays money. And, and, and spends money on tickets, and that's a very important thing to have. Also on the card is another heavyweight qualifying fight between Levy Rigters and Martin Terpstra. Levy is a tall, skilled, long fighter. He's been he's been dubbed the Prince of Kickboxing. Uh, he has some you know great skills, questionable cardio. We haven't seen him in a few years for various reasons. Martin Terpstra is a long reigning infusion heavyweight champion who was on a huge win streak until he lost to Uku Yuriandal. Um, he had like. 10 title defenses or something like that in a row in infusion. He's also massively tall. He's almost seven feet tall. It's very impressive. Um, this is going to be two tall boys throwing down. I think both men in this fight need to prove themselves. This is a really good fight for both men to put a stamp on the division. Uh, they're in a place where fans are questioning their skills or questioning their future in this heavyweight division. This is the time to really put it on and impress fans. Um, I don't think, like, even if Levy Rigters wins a, a a decision, I don't think people are going to be impressed. I don't think that's going to silence his doubters. Martin Terpstra, same thing. I think he really needs to push and make a stamp and make this fight memorable. I don't think fans are going to be happy with the decision win here, but we'll see it. This is too heavyweight, so we'll see how it goes. It could be a mess. It could be boring. It could be a very exciting fight. Heavyweight is, is weird like that. You never really know how it's going to turn out. Now, of course, we also have on the card, uh, another fight that I'm looking forward to is Luis Tavares versus Bogdan Stoika. You're probably wondering why the name Bogdan Stoika is so familiar. It's like a name you know, but you can't quite place it. Why do I know that name? Bogdan Stoika is, a, is an amazing name that you've probably seen on other people's records. So he has famous losses to both Antonio Plazabot and Israel Adesanya in kickboxing. Uh, Stoika is a good defensive fighter. He covers up he shells up rather than countering or returning or parrying and returning. He just shells up. Uh, he's a good distance kicker. Um, I've described Bogdan Stoika as like a video game character, right? Like And like an old school fighter in a video game where you have four buttons so you can do four moves. So he essentially has four moves that he'll just go back to over and over again. Um, he loves an, uh, an overhand and a lead uppercut, both of which he opens combinations He'll open exchanges with a, a, an overhand and a lead uppercut. He also has a flying knee and a spinning back kick. And I know some people are saying, well, he also does the inside leg kick. Like five moves. This guy's five moves. And he's actually quite good. And these moves work. He, he is good defensively sound. And the five moves that he does do, he is very good at. Um, 
Uh, but yeah, he doesn't deviate from those rules very much. Anyway, so let's look at Luis Tavares. So Luis Tavares uh, had had a short suspension due to PEDs. Fine, fine, fine. Um, he is just coming off a loss at heavyweight. So he went up to heavyweight to test his luck there. Ran into Baharam Rajab Zeda, got knocked out at heavyweight, and you know now he's now he's back at light heavyweight. The thing is, here's the secret though: Luis Tavares went up to heavyweight to fight Bahram Rajab Zeta. Bahram Rajab Zeta is also a light heavyweight fighter. Luis Tavares was the bigger man in that fight. So to say like, oh, he lost to a heavyweight, it was a size thing. No, it wasn't. Luis Tavares was bigger in there. Anyway, I really like Luis Tavares. He's a super cool guy. F- super fun to talk to. Always a good interview. Um, so I'm a little bit biased when it's, you know, you know, when it's a fighter that I've interviewed a bunch of times versus a fighter I've not spoken to. It's, I'm, I'm not going to hide my bias. You know what I mean? Anyway, Luis is, is also a guy that Glory really likes, so they try to put the sell on him. He's always in press conferences, and he's always in highlight reels, and you know he's, he's and he's a very talented fighter. He does deserve that kind of sell. He's a tight inside fighter with tons of pressure, uh, impressive combination work. He's highly skilled. Uh, but yeah, I think if you're a betting guy, I think this is a very safe bet for Luis Tavares to get back in the win column. Uh, those are the fights that I really wanted to cover off on this. Uh, Glory 89 card. It is a very good card. Now, if you are in Morocco, this fight is entirely free for you to stream. So, uh, and, and that's great. And um, and also Badr Hari will be the third or fourth fight on the main card, something like that. Uh, so you won't even have to stay up very late to watch him fight. So that's great news. And, and I forgot as well, uh, Mohamed Tushasi will be making his long-awaited debut. He's been a, a, a staple of the infusion kickboxing organization and now he is in glory and just what a tremendous signing he is especially for that middleweight division where we really need a couple more contenders we're building up Mohamed Tushasi is a dangerous addition to that collection of fighters and he's going to be fighting Edward Alexanian who is an experienced kickboxer also from Bulgaria and is on a very impressive win streak in Senshi um I, I, I've been asked to cover Senshi more. I've learned a little bit about it. I'm still not entirely confident. I know what Senshi is. It is in the kick sport family. It's not quite kickboxing. It's not quite Muay Thai, but he's, he was on a big win streak there. So it should be a very fun fight in the middleweight division to build up a, a, a very, very likely a future contender within the next six months, I would argue. Uh, but yeah, Mohamed Tushasi is definitely a person that you need to keep your eye on over the next few years. Let's move forward into one championship now as they have one Fight Night 15 booked for this weekend um, and it has some kickboxing fights on it. So I'm more than happy to talk about it. It's mostly MMA fights, but let's talk about some of the kickboxing fights that are on it. Uh, The Muay Thai world champion Tawan Shai has been booked in a featherweight kickboxing bout against Smokin' Joe Natawat. This is, it's just, it's just a slightly funny thing. Give me a second. Give me a second. But kickboxers in one championship have been struggling to get booked because one championship is just not overly interested in kickboxing at this moment. So, for example, if you're in that uh, like cruiserweight division that they have or the middleweight or welterweight division, you've barely there's barely been any fights in any of those divisions for the last little while here. But the Muay Thai division, they love. And if you're a Muay Thai fighter, you can get booked quite frequently in one championship. Um, you have no problem getting fights in one if you're a Muay Thai fighter. So much so that kickboxers... S- switch into Muay Thai because they'll get more fights that way. Um, and clearly it's just, it's just working for one championship. I'm sure they have some numbers in the back room of like, here's our numbers on events headlined by kickboxing. Here's our numbers, uh, that we get on events headlined by Muay Thai. And they just look at it and say like, look, we're going to prioritize Muay Thai for a little while here. This is really working. Um, so I get it. So I get it. Tawan Shai is also a Muay Thai champion and he may become a generationally important Muay Thai fighter. He's one of those people like, it feels like you might be watching history here with 10 more wins. You know, he's a young man. He might get 10 more wins in Muay Thai and be one of those very important fighters. So they booked him in kickboxing. (laughs) Now he's going to be fighting Smokin' Joe Nadawat. To be fair to Smokin' Joe Nadawat, despite being a Thai fighter who also has a world championship in Muay Thai, he is primarily a kickboxer. He has not done a lot of Muay Thai over the past decade. Is almost his entire meaningful career has been in kickboxing, so it is a kickboxing fight. Uh, this was the replacement for the Superbond fight. Superbond was going to Superbond, the former kickboxing champion, was going to fight Tawan Shai, the Muay Thai champion for the Muay Thai title in a Muay Thai fight, of course. Um, uh, Superbond got quite a severe calf injury, so wishing him all the best, a speedy recovery, awesome guy. Uh, so they brought in Smoke and Joe Natawat, switched to a kickboxing fight. I'm not entirely sure why they did that. 
I suppose they want Tom and Shai to get more wins in the kickboxing division to fight Shingiz Alazov, because Shingiz Alazov has stated point blank that he has no interest in Muay Thai and no interest in MMA. He has no interest in super fights. This guy just shows up for kickboxing fights. That's the thing he likes to do. And he's not going to take it any other way. Shingi Zalazov is a cool, cool guy. Anyway, where was I? Anyway, so it would be, the way this is booked, it would be, uh, Smoking Joe Nadawad is a very skilled fighter, um, has fought the best of the best in these divisions. It would be a major surprise, though, if he won this fight. This should be a win for Tawin Shai, uh, just a tremendous outside, powerful kicker, uh, power in each of his limbs. He's got knockouts with both his left foot, right foot, Left hand, right hand, he's an awesome fighter to watch. Anyway, where was I? Uh, Jonathan DiBella is also on the card looking to defend his strawweight kickboxing throne against the Australian Thai fighter, Daniel Williams. Both of these gentlemen I have interviewed uh, multiple times in my career. Um, You can check out tons of interviews that I've done with these men, and each one is a great interview. Um, The fight itself is quite good. Daniel Williams has fought people like Rod Tang and Superlek in Muay Thai. Those were in higher weight classes. So he was at a tremendous disadvantage and still had an amazing fight with Rod Tang. Uh, you know, he honorably got knocked out by Superlek. Cool. That's great. Um, uh, he was a, in this strawweight division, he was building quite an impressive list of wins in MMA. Um, and then uh, Jonathan Devella needed a contender in this division. There hasn't been a ton of fights in this division since they've introduced it last year. Uh, so they they got Daniel Williams versus Jonathan Devella. Jonathan Devella is, of course, coming off of his fight of the year contender against Jang Paiman, in which he was able to win a kickboxing masterclass. What an amazing fight that was. Uh, he was, he, and it was back and forth, and he was, he was getting better as the fight went on because he was spotting openings and he was spotting opportunities that weren't there before. Jang Paiman was slowing down. He's a young man. I think he's, he was 18 years old at the time. Now he's only 19 or 20 or something like that. They're likely to do a rematch very quickly uh, because one championship very much likes Zhang Paiman. But Jonathan DeBella, just an awesome, awesome guy, unbeaten in professional boxing, unbeaten in professional kickboxing, an Italian Canadian fighter where all of his fights have been from New York. Uh, he puts that Italian background and wears it on his sleeve proudly. Jonathan DeBella has an awesome story and an amazing fighting family. This is what he's been building towards for his entire life. He sacrificed his entire life. Every time I talk to him, I try to ask, like, what video games did you like? What cartoons did you watch growing up? What was high school like? He's like, I didn't do any of that. It was just training. Man, this is why he does it. Anyway, for the strawweight kickboxing title, I think if you're a betting man, you could probably put a safe bet on Jonathan DeBella. Um, Also this weekend, coming up tomorrow, will be one Friday night. Fights 36. This will be live from Lumpini Stadium, uh, part of the Muay Thai series that One Championship is putting on there. There are a few notable fighters on the card that I would like you to keep an eye on. Super Bowl, of course, like if he needs to be on your radar yesterday, he had maybe the biggest Muay Thai fight of 2022 when he fought Superlek. Um, but yeah, he's been on a list of wins, just coming off a loss in Lumpini Stadium. It's hard to tell with these young men of like 26 years old, Super Bowl build up a tremendous legacy, maybe a pound for pound talent going right now kind of thing. It's hard to say, but like maybe he's over his prime already, but I would still say keep an eye on this young man. Of course, Pong Siri is on the card as well. This is definitely someone you need to keep an eye on. You have uh, Porn Siri and Petch Dam, Rambong. Uh, There's a lot of really good fighters for you to keep an eye on for this one Friday fight series. Um, If you can watch it live, that's great. But if you just catch the highlights later, that's okay. And also, if you are a person who knows a ton more about Thai kickboxing and the the stadium scenes more than I do, let me know what other fighters that we should be keeping an eye on in these Lumpini series. Uh, Because sometimes it's very obvious who we should be watching, like Super Bowl. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's less obvious. Also, I want to get a perspective from some people who know a little bit more about the Thai scene in, in just a second, but let, let me get, talk through this first. This weekend is also the second set of finals of the RWS Muay Thai Grand Prix that they've been putting on for the last several months here. Uh, so this will have a the final of the welterweight division, which is 147 pounds. This is the final of the tournament with 3 million baht on the line. Uh, this is going to be Ritawada. We'll be fighting Hercules. You also have the finals of the super welterweight division, which is at 154 pounds. This is going to be Yodwachai versus Thananchai. Both fights should be electric. I'm expecting action out of both fights. You can watch it on DAZN, or if you're in Thailand, you can watch it for free on YouTube. Uh, also on the card is going to be a lightweight title bout. It's going to be Jom, going to be fighting uh, a young man from England, Alfie. Alfie has never lost in his professional career. He had some ISCA titles in the past. Uh, but yeah, now we get to fight for an RWS title. So this is a question that I have for people 
who are uh, maybe in Thailand and have better perspective than I do, because I can only speak from someone who's living in the West and watches a lot of fight sports. But RWS, this is their really big finale here. They've done two finals in a row here, and it didn't feel like there was a ton of coverage, and it didn't feel like there was a ton of excitement around it. But that's speaking as someone who, I, I paid a lot of attention to kick sports, Muay Thai and kickboxing and other stuff, but I wonder if they're may, maybe not looking so much internationally and they're just looking to build up equity in the nation of Thailand. So if you have some perspective living in Thailand or, or you know, like tell me what RWS is like in Thailand. Are they building up in a way that is meaningful? Are they building up a future for themselves? Have they built excitement for their event? Please let me know what the perspective on RWS is because I really like their product. I think RWS is a ton of fun. They are uh, not quite traditional stadium Muay Thai. They're more action Muay Thai while still pleasing Muay Thai purists. Um, Yeah, I I don't know. I've had a good time covering them. Um, But yeah. All right, folks. um, I will be back next week. Thank you so much for your patience. I'll be back on Wednesday next week. This week, I got back a little bit later, so uh, I wasn't able to get it out on the usual day. Thank you so much for your patience on this lovely Thursday afternoon. Uh, But yeah, folks, enjoy the fights this weekend. Let me know what your thoughts are. I'm always curious what you folks think. What is the legacy of Badr Ahari? If you got time, type it up. I know it's quite a novel that everyone wants to say. Everyone's just waiting to be asked what they think, and I'm curious what you folks think. Anyway, my name is Tim Wheaton. Thank you for joining me for this episode, and I will talk to you folks next week.